ready? Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is ja Javed Anbar. I'm the chair of the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Ed Educational Analytics. It is 9.12 a.m. I would like to call the October 25th, 2023 Committee on Innovation, Data, Educational Analytics meeting to order. This meeting is being held via live broadcast. Before I like to take this opportunity to welcome those joining us via video conference and also that you observe the following etiquette. Please state your name before you speak. Mute, mute your telephone not speaking and keep background noise to minimum. Members, I call your name. Please announce your presence. As Javed Anwar present, welcome Wilson. Welcome, Wilson. He's on his He's way. On He's not here. Richard Clever. Present. Fred Farias. Present. Stacy Hoff. Present. Ashley Thomas. Present. Daniel Wall. Present. Gage Swires. Please record, please record in the minute that we have a post. And agenda item number two is consideration of possible action to approve the minutes of July 26, 2023 committee meeting. Members, do I have a motion and a second, please? I'll make a motion. Second. We got any discussion? Those in favor say aye, and those opposed say no. Aye. Motion passes. Agenda item number three is the public testimony on agenda item relating to Committee on Innovation, Data, and Ed Education Analytics. We do not have any register to testify, so we'll go to the next item. Agenda item number four is consideration of possible action to approve the consent calendar. The consent calendar includes the item that can be approved without comments and or discussion. This allows us to save time and the other items that need more of our attention. The con consent items are highlighted in gray on the agenda. Of course, any board member can request that an agenda item can be added or removed from the consent calendar. We are going to work on the consent in items two votes, one on the non-rule item and one on the rules item. Remember, for following the non-rules, there is a consent calendar for consideration. Agenda items 5C is consideration possible action to approve the replacement of a member on the health-related institution formula advisory committee for 2026 and 2027 by name. Agenda item 5D, consideration of possible action to adopt recommendation relating to the facility audit report. Does anyone want to remove any item from the non-rule consideration? Are there items that anybody want to add to the consent calendar. Remember, do I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. I need a second, please. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Say no. Motion passes. Agenda item. Agenda 5F1, consideration of possible action to adopt amendments to the board rule 17.2AS concerning name changes from tuition revenue bond to capital construction assistance project. Agenda item 5.2 is consideration of possible action to adopt amendments to rule 17.112 concerning data required for you in facilities audits. Consideration of 
Agenda Num 5F3 is consideration of possible action to amend Board Rules 22.1618 concerning the future occupation and reskilling workforce advancement to research demand for our loan, loan program. Does anyone want to remove any items from the consent council? Members do have a motion for approval of the proposed rules items on the consent plan. Do I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second, please. Second. All approved, say aye. 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 Anybody approved, say no. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Brownmore. Yes. Uh, in the minutes show that Mr. Wilson Wilson Jr. is now uh, present for the committee. Okay. For the minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. So well, welcome, Wilson is present now, just to let you know. The motion 5F3 passes. Agenda item 5A. Dr. Melissa Humphreys, Assistant Commissioner for Management and Research will present this item, will be available to answer any question. This item is only for uh, information. Melissa, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I'm Melissa Humphreys, the Assistant Commissioner for Data Management and Research. Can you bring your mic closer. Sure. I'm Melissa Humphreys, Assistant Commissioner for Data Management and Research, and I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about our preliminary enrollment numbers for Fall 2023. Next, um, first, some background about this data. The Coordinating Board has collected this information for several decades from institutions, and each fall, we request preliminary headcounts from all Texas institutions. This includes publics and private nonprofit institutions. We request this information shortly after the census date in the fall, which is traditionally the fall capacity. We get a 100% response rate for the data collection, and I want to recognize the effort it takes from the institutions to get this done during a very busy time in the semester. I also want to quickly thank um, Torcha Button and David Mead on the DMR for helping select this information from institutions and pilots. The final numbers for fall enrollment are being submitted and certified now, and we'll have updated trends to give you in January. And I want to emphasize that these are preliminary numbers, and historically, these numbers have been slightly higher than the final certified numbers we see at the end of the semester. Usually, this comes out to be about a 2%, uh, it comes out to be 2% lower once we have all the data. Next slide, please. Before we look closely at the data, I want to call out a few highlights from the trends we're seeing this year. First, we did see an overall statewide increase in enrollment compared to 2022 of 2.5%. Uh, All higher education sectors have surpassed pre-pandemic enrollment numbers except for community colleges. We also saw increases in all rates of ethnicity groups with slightly less deep increases for white and Latino students. And finally, from 2022 to 2023, female student enrollment increased, which is especially notable because since the pandemic, female enrollments have decreased each year. Next slide, please. Great, so here we see the preliminary fall 2023 enrollment raw numbers by institution type in the bolded box. We're comparing it to the certified numbers from fall 2022. The rightmost column shows the percent difference between this year and last year. Statewide, as mentioned before, enrollments increased by 2.5%, which comes to about 37,800 students. As shown, all higher ed sectors experience an increase in fall enrollments. And these trends are actually similar to early national data that's coming out now about fall enrollments. Next slide, please. Um, the column added to the right here shows the percentage change in fall enrollment for 2019 to 2023 in an effort to see how numbers compare to pre-pandemic levels. All sectors except for public two-year colleges have surpassed their enrollments in 2019. Statewide though, altogether, compared to 2019, we are still down about 28,000 students. Next slide, please. This table breaks out enrollment numbers within the two-year sector. So two-year sectors, two-year schools are made up of community, 
Texas State Technical Colleges, and Lamar State Colleges. From 22 to 23, there were increases in enrollment across all types of two-year schools. However, enrollment growth at the Technical State, the Texas State Technical Colleges, excuse me, and Lamar State Colleges outpaced enrollments at community colleges. And this has been true for the past few years as well. Next slide, please. Here where we add comparisons to fall 2019, you can really see the differences in growth across the type of two-year schools. Community colleges still have not met their pre-pandemic enrollment numbers, while CSDCs and state colleges have surpassed the 2019. Next slide, please. This graph shows how the enrollment counts for our public two-year and public universities compare over the last 23 years. The graph illustrates points of fluctuation in both sectors, as well as the share of enrollments held by each sector. The gray bars represent major points of economic change. So you'll see the recessions in the early 2000s, the recession from 2007 to 2009, and then the pandemic. This is worth noting because we can see how during these times, two-year institution enrollment often fluctuates more noticeably than four-year. Since the early 2000s, two-year enrollments have made up the majority of all enrollments in Texas, but over the pandemic, enrollments across these two sectors reached parity. This year, two-year enrollments hit 51% of all enrollments. It's definitely too soon to tell if this is a turning point and a trend, but it's an interesting to note. And also, um, as I mentioned before, matches what we're seeing in national trends and uh, all enrollments. Next slide, please. As part of building the Talent Strong Texas Plan, we made a commitment to this aggregating our data by demographic groups. Here we're showing the enrollment numbers by race ethnicity for 2022 and 2023. Although enrollment across all racial ethnic groups increased, this increase was smaller among white and Latino students whose growth was about 1%. It's worth noting, however, that this is the first year since the pandemic that there have been increases in enrollment among all racial ethnic groups. Next slide, please. This slide breaks out enrollment information by gender. From 2022 to 23, enrollments across both genders increased, with the increase for male enrollments being slightly steeper. Something to note, as I mentioned before, female enrollments have been decreasing every year since 2019, and this is the first year we're seeing an increase. The bar graph on the right shows the share that each gender makes up of the total enrollment for 2022 and 23. The percentages are fairly stable since last year, with the share of females decreasing about 0.6 percentage points, but they are still the majority of enrollments in higher Next slide, please. This concludes my presentation on our preliminary enrollment numbers. We will have additional insight for you after our certified numbers submit at the end of the semester. Um, and I'm happy to open the floor to any questions. Uh, did you say is this? Did you say this is pretty much consistent with uh, nationwide percentages? Yes, many of these. On trends, average. Yeah, and I we've only seen preliminary information about national trends, but these seem to be in line with lower. Um, any guess or any speculation, or maybe you have some data to show that why 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 we have less enrollment in community college in terms of percentage than the PSDC and normal college? I mean, you know, why 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 yeah. this is this That's a good question. The commissioner might want to um, try into, but we've seen this the difference over the past few years of the pandemic. It seems like PSDC and Lamar have maybe been able to. Um, be a little more nimble during the pandemic. Well, the, I would point to the sort of difference in missions also between like, like TSCC is really exclusively focused on high demand workforce programs. And so they're focused on short term high demand workforce programs. And they did, um, they did uh, 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 move very strategically to expand those programs over the last couple of years. Uh, community colleges have, uh, they've got a much broader mission. So they have uh, they, students in Additional transfer programs. They've got many more credit students. Um, they've got uh, they work with firms as well, but they have a wider range of programs. So that some of the workforce programs, even that they offer at community colleges, would not be programs that TSTC would offer because they're not sort of the high demand, high wage programs that TSTC has. That's sort of their niche. Um, so I I'm encouraged, but I wouldn't 
the, what I'm seeing with our community colleges. I just have come back from a couple of national meetings where, you know, they're overall we're consistent with national trends, but we are there. You do see a number of states where they they've seen enrollments uh, decline, um, and you know, our as our economy continues to be strong, one of the one of the explanations for why community college enrollments have been down has been because of the availability of entry level jobs and more more job opportunities, folks can not enroll or not re-enroll in the college. So despite that, we're, we are seeing uh, some, some uh, encouraging increases even this fall in community college enrollments. There's a slice of that I'd point to that is uh, dual credit enrollments as high school students. And uh, one of the things I highlight there is that we already have uh, moved into implementation on our fast grant uh, um, program so they can offer dual credit and talks to students who are eligible for free reduced lunch. Um, so we have had um, I think 47 institutions, both uh, colleges and universities, but the majority of community colleges have opted into that. And we have been seeing some growth in the, the dual credit courses, especially for, uh, for students who are low income. Buying so that's part of what is in that uh, enrollment growth. Part. Based, uh, based on this uh, kind of last three years experience, do you think the community college may have something to learn from this? this in terms of uh, uh, the workforce, uh, uh, workforce structure. structure. Yeah, I, I, um, so I, I do think um, uh, to, to do something to learn from TSTC um, overall, I'd say uh, absolutely yes. TSTC has been very good, um, strategic. At, Analyzing the trends uh, in their in workforce data and identifying the high wage uh, workforce programs that they want to focus on uh, that are in high demand to their region. Uh, and they've expanded those programs quickly. Uh, we haven't had the same expansion of workforce programs in the community colleges. So, so that was one of the drivers in Hospital 8 to move to an outcomes based system. So, that like the TSTCs have had outcomes based funding for multiple years. So, as they've been increasing, what they supply in the high demand programs, then the state has has uh, provided uh, incentive funds. For it. The community colleges have not had the benefit of that um, until now with the implementation of hospitality. So I think one of the things we'll want to watch very carefully over this next uh, couple of years is: Are we do we see the shift in uh, uh, community college enrollments where we see more work? Programs in particular, which um, hopefully we'll be able to see more growth in those programs, um, as well as sort of in, in, uh, more furniture being the word overall. Um, just a reminder the board, that, you know, the board um, has the authority to set those incentives to for the college. So as you're seeing changes in that data, like we'll, we'll be coming back to you in April and in July to talk about where you'd want to set those incentives. Or the community colleges for F125. So that'll be, so you may want to think about like, do you, how do you make sure the incentives are aligned and where should we set those so that you're going to see more of that growth in programs you want to see? Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I will say we have, once the final certified data is in, we'll be able to take a deeper look at the types of enrollments in, at community colleges. And we're happy to provide that detail to you once that's, that's all in. Yeah, so Commissioner, following up what you said, um, and uh, Dr. Wong, is that, you know, when you look at the differences between Texas State technical colleges and your point about how you learn you know, from that overall educational system, you got to realize, too, that there's about 17,000 plus students uh, in Texas State technical colleges in our state, which uh, outcomes-based funding is way ahead of the curve. Uh, and so now look at now, community colleges now. Um, outcome based, thanks to the legislature and this board, uh, to be able to improve outcomes uh, and really gauge it. When you have 665,000 community college students plus, uh, you know, it's a little bit more to keep up with. Um, so I think there could be some challenges there, but there are some learning um, ideas and curves that I think that you're correct that community colleges can deal with. You know, we've got 50 community colleges and about eight technical colleges. Uh, and so, you know, you've got that, you know, to, to deal with as well. 
but I think those are really good points in terms of finally looking at what is working and how community colleges, our 50 community colleges in our state can actually uh, you know, achieve uh, you know, future goals. I had another point, Dr. Humphreys. So, you know, since I've been on the board for a while, it's always that the males were not, you know, going into secondary higher education. And now the data is showing females. So, um, you know, I get invited to, to white coat ceremonies and health related professions and uh, graduations. And I'm seeing like almost 70 to 75% are females in the health professions. Um, and I was, I was wondering, you know, in terms of that versus the numbers and the figures you have now kind of are, are different, right? They're completely opposite. Yeah, that's a really good call out. And I'd be, we'd be happy to break it up by sector and looking at the gender, um, the gender trends. Yeah, because before it was about maybe even five or six years ago, as I recall, it was you know more women going into higher education. And now the trends are opposite. So it could be also that maybe males have to go to work or uh, or choosing other careers because uh, post pandemic. I don't know, but I think it'd be interesting to compare maybe a graph of the data of maybe five, six years ago uh, and see because I think the trends are not Just to clarify, I mean, more women are going into higher ed than males still by a significant margin. So um, I don't think that that trend is reversed. It'd be great to see that how, in all of these cases where we're breaking out by um, gender or by ethnicity and race, how those percentiles map to the population. And um, just as something to add, just so we have a sense of where are, you know, where is there a discrepancy that's not as representative of, of our population at large. Um, I did have one question about the, the growth is at about two and a half percent. You said traditionally when it settles, these numbers come down about two percent. So are you anticipating total? Yeah, total. Are you anticipating um, it being perhaps flat year over year? I or think it'll flat? still be a flight. Yeah. Why is it? I I will note too. We did look at. I didn't put on the slide, but I'm happy to add that to it and send. But um, we did look at overall population of Texas and the race ethnic breakup, and compared to the overall demographics of Texas. Um, in this enrollment data, African American white students are underrepresented and Asian and international students are overrepresented. This, the last, we're not looking at it now, but there's um, a category for all other race ethnicities. And um, this is especially difficult to piece apart for the preliminary data because right now a lot of the data we got from the institution um, race ethnicity is unknown. So I don't wanna necessarily say this is where it all lands because I think a lot of that, those, uh, many of those numbers will shift. And I, my data. I'm sure you have this data as well. Do you have some sense of how, what percentage of high school graduates are matriculating? And then also for this body of students, what percentage this represents? Yeah, that's numbers. a great question. Actually, the commissioner just asked for this the other day from us, and we did see last year an increase in direct from high school matriculation at right. about 2%. 22%. Now it's still only about 47%. Yeah. So we've got a long, we have a long way to go. We're, we're lagging the nation a little bit on those direct college and rates, and that's the, so that that's an issue. Um, so we, but but to your point, um, so we we can pull together uh, broken down by like type of program by race and ethnicity, race and ethnicity, but also by sex, and you see some variation across like. What kinds of fields we are going into and what the growth has been over time. Um, and then um, the direct college enrollment rates, they we were losing ground for a few years. It does look like it started to maybe hopefully turn that around just a little bit, uh, but we've got a ways to go. Yeah, and Stacey, you're right. I meant the percentage change right. of that because there's still, but the percentage change was actually greater for males than it was for females. I, I know, I know. I think it just always for the context of just saying the technical school, it's like the law of small numbers. If you're yeah. being underrepresented for a while, then you're playing some catch up. And so you can't always right. compare the growth numbers that's when right. one's already there, already higher. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's why it's important to always look at the share <laughs> that's overall, right. overall as well. Yeah. The percentage of market share. <laughs> right. <laughs> Any other question? If not, we move on to agenda item 5B. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Emily 
Co-Mayor, Assistant Commissioner for Funding will present this item and we are available to answer any questions desiring for information. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Emily Cormier, Assistant Commissioner for Funding. And so I'll be providing a brief update on the activities of the Formula Funding Advisory Committees. Moving to the next slide. So just to lay the groundwork, um, formula funding is the dominant way in which the state funds our institutions of higher education. There's unique formulas for each different sector of higher education, and they all have different metrics and are used to have a way to equitably allocate state funding amongst the different institutions. So as part of the legislative appropriations process, the coordinating board is statutorily required to provide recommendations to legislature on funding levels and various other inputs every two years to legislature. And so as part of that process, we're also required to convene an expert group of committee members. So that's where the formal advisory committees come into play. So we have two different groups, the general academic institutions, which now include technical and state colleges. Um, just kind of a side note, due to the changes with hospital eight, the community college is no longer part of the advisory committee process. They have a standing advisory committee. So the other two year sectors, the technical and state colleges were consolidated with the general academic institutions. And then there's also the health related institutions form of advisory. And so this group provides information on formal funding levels, mechanics, and other inputs um, to the board. And it's really used as a way to, for the institutions to signal to the coordinating board and hopefully therefore signal to the legislature on things to consider as they're going through the appropriations process. So this could be things like calling out inflation pressures or even small technical issues in the formulas that need to be cleaned up. And then this kind of goes through the process and it actually um, sets the stage for how the coordinating board collects student and course level data from each of the institutions um, every year. And then how we provide that data to the legislature, both prior to the legislative session when they're crafting the appropriations um, bill, and then also during the legislative session when they're finalizing the appropriations bill. So moving to the next slide. Um, so really, the advisory committee process picks up almost immediately after the last legislative session. So the commissioner um, of higher education must set charges for each of the groups, and that occurs in August. So even before the new biennium fiscal year begins, um, the groups can be in and start looking at different uh, charges related to the formulas, and those can be anything that the commissioner determines or others that are required based on statute or rule, or sometimes the appropriations bill requires us to have the groups look at things. So in the spring, the formal advisory committee will bring forward recommendations to the commissioner, who will bring forward recommendations to the board for adoption, and then we're required to provide that by June 1st. And so then, in, as I noted before, moving through the summer and fall, we'll provide that data to the legislative budget board and the governor's office. So moving to the next slide. And this is just a quick layout of the different charges that are being considered during this fall. Um, so on this one, this is for the general academic state and technical colleges. The first three are basically just the generic funding level charge. So to consider every formula and make recommendations on the funding um, required for each of those different formulas. Um, and those are unique for each of the general academics, the state colleges, and then the state technical colleges. There's also kind of a catch-all charge for just generally look at all inputs and metrics in the formulas. And then finally, there is a co-charge. Um, so this is kind of unique this year. There's a charge that was set to both the general academic institutions and the health-related to look at the differences in funding for GAIs and health and HRIs, particularly for similar programs such as nursing and pharmacy. So moving to the next slide. I have a question on that question. Okay. So if there's programs around the state that are in general academic, now is the time for them to kind of uh, chime in with this advisory committee? Yes. So the pharmacy and nursing is the kind of common ones that are talked about. But, but there are like health profession yeah. groups that also that are right now classified under GAI can also uh, now talk to the advisory. That's right. Have input. The chart is very broad, so the group can really look at any program that they like. Thank you. Moving to the next slide. So this is the um, health-related institution formal advisory charges. So again, the first two are kind of the 
standard funding levels and formula inputs. And then we have a charge relating to a kind of very technical issue in the instruction operations formula for the health related. Um, there's a supplement for small classes that are outside the main campus um, that we'll be asked the group to look at. And then the mission specific formulas um, is kind of a new thing that proliferated amongst health related in the past 12 sessions. So in the past decade or more, there was traditionally only two mission-specific formulas, so those at MD Anderson and UC Health Science Center Tyler, and those were to really recognize their unique mission as our cancer center hospital and our chest disease center hospital. And so, I have a question on that. With the new announcement of MD Anderson moving to Austin and the new academic medical center, is that going to be for this biennium? Do they have to work on that as well now? I don't know exactly when that will open up or when that is going to occur. Um, but there has been a recent increase in the number of research and cl other clinical based mission specific formulas across the health related institutions. And so, due to the kind of really quick increase in the number um, and size of them, the group has been charged with looking at the implementation of these and considering similarities across the different um, types of. And then, lastly, we've got the same coach charge we just talked about. That concludes my remarks. I'm happy to take any questions. Members, are there any questions? If not, we move on to agenda item 5C to 5D. Agenda item 5C to 5D on the consent calendar. Agenda item 5E is consideration of possible action to delegate authority to the commissioner of higher education to approve and submit the data reports required by Texas Education Code Section 61.0662D. Ms. Emily Pong, Assistant Commissioner for Funding, will present this item and will be available for yes, any questions. So this item is a request for the board to delegate authority to the commissioner to submit a legislatively mandated report on research conducted at our institutions. So the coordinating board is required to submit a report to the legislature on the amount institutions spend on stem cell research and the source of funds by January 1st of each year. However, we do not collect the research expense data until December 1st of the prior fiscal year, meaning there's not enough time to bring it forward to our board for the legislatively mandated due date. So this item would delegate the authority to submit the report um, to the legislature using the data provided by institutions uh, by the deadline to the Commissioner of Higher Education. Any questions? If not, I have a, anybody may need a motion and a second, please. I'll make a motion. All in favor say aye. All in favor, all against it say aye. Aye. Motion passes. We move on to agenda item 5 1 to 5 F 3 for approved on the cons consent calendar. We move to agenda item number 6. Is the chairman to have a motion in the second? All in favor say aye. Aye. Agent item six passed. This hearing for my item on education, moving on innovation data 